In August 1955, Emmett Till, a 14-year-old African-American boy, was spending his summer holidays with some relatives in Mississippi. He came from Chicago, and even though segregation in those days was part of daily life all over the country, Till had been advised by his mother about the substantial differences between the North and the South. It was in that South of Jim Crow laws that an innocent prank would cost him life, and the evidence of his murder would trigger a social movement. Emmett Till was riding around with his friends in the town of Money, Mississippi. They stopped by a grocery store, where he had a brief chat with the shopkeeper, a white young woman called Carolyn Bryan. It seems that Till's friends dared him to ask her for a date and that he whistled at her, but the facts of this event have always remained uncertain. Three days later, Till was kidnapped from his relative's house by at least three white men, the woman's husband, Roy Bryan, and her brother-in-law, J.W. Millen, included. He was driven to Millen's tool shed, where he was brutally beaten. Then, the men took him next to the Tallahassee River and shot him in the head. Finally, they tied a cotton gin fan to his neck and threw the corpse to the river. When a fisherman found it, it was in such a state that it was very hard to identify. Allegedly, this is the reason why the county sheriff ordered the immediate burial. But Till's mother, Mammy Till Bradley, refused and demanded her son's remains to bury him in Chicago. This was the first of a series of action that Bradley would take against an authority willing to remove all traces of racial violence. In those days, such violence was not uncommon, but for most of the population, it was invisible. Mass media will not cover these crimes, and even black magazines will remain reluctant to show such a raw reality. Although Bradley got the body, the sheriff made sure that the casket remained sealed, putting a legal warning on it. But again, she will not accept to conceal the injustice of the crime. So the casket was opened, and the woman, in an unpredictable act of protest, decided that instead of sealing it again and hide the horror of what she saw, she will make it public for all the world to see. Back in Chicago, she said to the funeral director that she wanted an open casket funeral. He suggested retouching the face of the boy to make it more presentable, but Bradley was determined not to minimize the injuries, so she refused and said, let the world see what I've seen. The consequences of her decision were soon to be seen, indeed. During the four-day viewing of the open glass-enclosed casket, Thousands of members of the community were confronted and overwhelmed by the view of Emmett Till, including journalists and photographers. Several popular magazines among the African-American people, such as Jet and the Chicago Defender, published pictures of the funeral, including close-ups of his face, looking unrecognizable, completely disfigured. From then on, a series of events took place all over the country, raising awareness of the civil rights movement. Roy Bryan and J.W. Millen were arrested and indicted for murder. The trial took place in September 1955. Both plead not guilty and were acquitted by an all-white, all-male jury after one hour deliberation. But if until this day no one has been punished, Emmett Till's murder had other important consequences. Once the shocking picture is published, its circulation is ensured because it touches an instinctive and universal characteristic in human beings, the morbid fascination for the tragedy and the grotesque. The initial resistance to see the evidence of some horrible event comes together with curiosity, which will ultimately prevail simply because the picture is there and we are outside, safe. It cannot hurt us. 
But the important point here comes after, because released in the ideal context, the picture becomes an undeniable proof of a fact. We can no longer pretend it does not exist. The picture, as opposed to painting, is not a representation, it comes from reality. Even though a picture is also the result of a point of view that could be manipulated to distort reality, in the case of a metal, it came straight from the real world. As Barth notes, I quote, The important thing is that the photograph possesses an evidential force and that its testimony bears not on the object but on time. From a phenomenological viewpoint, in the photograph, the power of authentication exceeds the power of representation. The picture of the boy in the casket shows what words can only evoke. It is a confrontation. However, this does not mean that words are not needed. Equally important that the pictures is the discourse and the media where they are printed and distributed. For as Alan Secula claims, I quote, the photograph, as it stands alone, presents merely the possibility of meaning. Only by its embeddedness in a concrete discourse situation can the photograph yield a clear semantic outcome. In other words, the picture certainly let us see, but with the picture alone, see is all we can do. Even more, Strictly speaking, Till no longer resembles himself. His facial features have been obliterated. So, paradoxically, we cannot see him, and he no longer expresses anything. He is not just dead, he has been destroyed. It is this extreme passivity that chuckles and paralyzes. But questions emerge soon after, and the discourse is essential to understand. What happened? Who could do this? And why? It is the inevitable paralysis of the picture, the subject's dead body, that produces a life after, strictly out of the frame, not an imaginary life that takes place in the mind of the spectator, but a life in the real world from being moved by to be mobilized for. Certainly, not all hard-to-see pictures produce a social mobilization. Pictures are produced and shared in a much higher volume than what we can process. Overexposition to pictures reduces our capacity to actually see them. Also, we may become insensitive. Overcirculation causes a depletion of meaning. A picture stands out of the mass because it talks to some particular people about a particular reality. To be moved and mobilized, we need to feel the picture speaking to us. The that could be me feeling that you have a rose from old Till's friends and cousins and now after see him in the casket. So the picture cannot be neither historical nor artistic. It should come stray from the real, present world. In the case of Emmett Till, the evidence of the crime was not meant to exist, but with the pictures taken at the funeral, the event got fixed in time and its original context with it. A second context is set when the picture is published for the first time. After that, all other contexts will be secondary because they will lack the proximity of the event. If Till's picture is featured in books or even in present-day protests, it will be as a part of history, not as a part of reality. In other words, the image turns into a representation. It is now the signifier of something rather than the evidence of it. This means that we can hardly imagine African-American people getting mobilized by this picture today. Its power to move may be everlasting but its power to mobilize is subject to time and context. Contrary to photojournalism, which is framing within the deontology of the practice in spite of the sensitive subjects, the pictures of Emmett Till are not the work of a journalist seeking for tragedy. They were permitted and encouraged by his own mother. So, 
it was Bradley's action which changed the course of the affair, because instead of asking for respect and romanticize the image of her son, she shared the horror. Even more, she shared both images. She pinned three pictures of the boy to the casket, looking healthy and happy. The juxtaposition made the contrast with the reality stronger. But to be mobilized, we must feel threatened. War pictures cause empathy, even pain. But these feelings are passive because the pictures show something happening sufficiently far, always to someone else. Emmett Till's pictures, on the contrary, feel close, as a real threat. More than empathy, they cause somatic identification and rage. This identification has not necessarily to do with being African-American, but with being part of a vulnerable minority that lives in constant danger. Because geopolitical issues are precisely located, allowing us to see the distance that separate them from us. But minority issues have no boundaries. They exist within the people as a fate. What Emmett Till's picture show was, on the one hand, the precision of boundaries, north and south, and on the other hand, the randomness of systematized hate. Maybe this is why even nowadays he remains in the memory of a nation as a martyr of the civil rights cause. We know images are powerful. Their power could be so strong as to replace the actual thing they represent. We do not question the assertion that an image is worth a thousand words, because we assume that visual language is universal. But what makes the pictures of Emmett Till special is that they are not just eloquent, they are unavoidable. The impact that these pictures had in a whole generation of African-American men and women can only be compared with the impact that the iconography of martyrs had in early Christianity. Suffering, sacrifice, agony, torture. Christian iconography has made us used to this kind of representation. But can we consider a Till a martyr? First of all, there is not actual sacrifice. The tale was not a noble, innocent boy willing to be sacrificed to obtain some kind of favor for his people. Neither his death was meant to be beneficial for others. There is no sin and no expiation. Still, Emmett Till may be a martyr for some other reasons. The first one is persecution. Martyrs are men and women persecuted because of their faith. Their salvation lies in the denial of such faith and the adoption of a new one. Till was persecuted for something that was not of his choice, his race, but in the end, for a martyr, faith is not a matter of choice either. Actually, not having a choice is a key sign. A martyr is supposed to be following a superior will. He or she is the chosen one for mysterious often incomprehensible reasons. Another sign of martyrdom is the sense of collectivity. Emmett Till was tortured and murdered not because of who he was as an individual, but because of who he was as a member of a community. He was a black man who dared to approach a white woman. The details of what happened that day are not important. For even if he did behave inappropriately, the punishment was completely out of proportion. He was not punished for himself, but to teach a lesson to black men. In the end, Till was an involuntary martyr, whose widely circulated pictures did actually bring vicarious benefits, helping to trigger the civil rights movement. Author Clonora Hudson Wims wrote a doctoral dissertation of the subject, which later turned into a book, Emmett Till, the Sacrificial Lamb of the Civil Rights Movement. Hudson Wims' research contributed to bring Till's case to the forefront and give it its place as the catalyst of the movement. As she asserts, I quote, most historians 
marked the beginning of the modern civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s with the rebellious act on December 1, 1955 of the established mother of the movement, Rosa Parks. Notwithstanding, the author's collection of testimonies compellingly proved that the encounter with Till's pictures left a much stronger mark on African American at the time. Rosa Parks herself was one of them. On December 1st, she was riding the bus in Montgomery, Alabama. She refused to give her seat to a white man, encouraged by the memory of the boy. She was arrested, accused of violating the segregation rules. Later, she will say, I thought of Emmett Till. I just couldn't move. Another African-American, Muhammad Ali, a boy of the Emmett Till generation, was so shocked by the pictures that he was encouraged to take immediate action. He tells in his autobiography, I quote, Emmett Till and I were about the same age. A week after he was murdered in Sunflower County, Mississippi, I stood on the corner with a gang of boys looking at pictures of him in the black newspapers and magazines. In one, he was laughing and happy. In the other, his head was swollen and bashed in, his eyes bulging out of their sockets and his mouth twisted and broken. I couldn't get Emmett out of my mind. Until one evening, I thought of a way to get back at white people for his death. Had Tell been buried in Mississippi and never been seen again, the civil rights movement would explode anyway. It was a matter of time. But what these pictures made was to put a face in the foreground. A once good-looking, full-of-life face turned into a dreadful, barely recognizable one. Tell became a martyr to five for an icon of racial violence, the face of a hate crime. Despite the violation of her privacy and grief, Bradley chose to turn the case into a public affair, and in doing so, she made it impossible to ignore. This is not just freedom of expression, but sacrifice, the collected costs of her personal interest. In Bradley's words, I quote, Two months ago, I'd had a nice apartment in Chicago. I had a good job. I had a son. When something happened to Negroes in the South, I said, that's their business, not mine. Now I know how wrong I was. The murder of my son has shown me that what happens to any of us, anywhere in the world, had better be the business of us all. Till was murdered because he was black, as a punishment. This means he was iconized before the pictures were taken. Pictures fixed the icon, but instead of being one of warning to black people and a proof of white supremacy, the actions of his mother turned into the icon of segregation and its more extreme consequences. Her actions were not free of controversy at that time, as they will not be nowadays. But the important thing is that by making the remains of her son open to the public view, she let people not only see, but be part of a public discussion on bigotry and hate, and to reflect themselves on it. Nowadays, mass media is under the oppression of a double standard established by the public opinion that asks for justice but refuses to see what is happening. Censorship imposed by political correction is changing the way pictures circulate. In an era where millions of pictures are produced and shared every day, we can hardly think of a magazine publishing Emmett Till's pictures had the crime occur in the present. But it is important to consider that censorship, rather than being a sign of respect, is a sign of denial. Since as long as there is no photographic evidence of the event, it may not have happened. If Bradley had accepted the decisions of the sheriff, her son would have been buried in Mississippi and she only would have imagined what happened. People who knew him will keep a nice memory of the boy, 
surrounding his pictures by the sweet nostalgia for the loved ones that are gone. In other words, another hate crime without consequences. Instead, Bradley lets see pictures that trouble a nation, that possibly scare a whole generation of African-American boys for life. Lee Redford notes that, I quote, the 1955 circulation of the till post-mortem photographs offer a refocusing of the liberatory and galvanizing potential of visual technology for black political communities. The color of his skin was black and his name was